Seattle, Washington, from the land of the Duwamish people. This is a land that has been inundated with smoke for a long time, making the air very unhealthy for everyone, but especially for small children, the elderly, people with compromised health systems, and those who are marginalized by our society, such as the farm workers who have worked in the fields despite the smoke. The smoke, of course, was caused by raging wildfires up and down the world that have uh, eaten through entire towns, that have devoured forests, that have killed the creatures that live in those forests. Now we have a reprieve here this weekend. I am so happy to be able to open the windows and go outside, but we know that the smoke's going to come back, if not this year, the next year. We know, we understand that around the world, millions upon millions of people are dealing with a lot worse than what we have dealt with here in Seattle. Because what we dealt with is part of a much larger crisis, the climate crisis. It's a crisis that involves unbelievable heat, droughts, floods, superstorms, mass migration, migration of the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. And time is running out for dealing with this. We also know that the climate crisis is intertwined with a number, number of other very major crises, such as the grotesque and growing gap between the wealthy few and the rest of us, the poverty that so many people are because of that gap, the other ecological disasters unfolding around us, the racist uh, epidemic, the uh, pandemic, and so many other things. We obviously need to act, and we need to act together. We need to act strategically. We need to identify what our real power is and use that power. System change, not climate change, is an eco-socialist network. It is composed primarily of people who live in the United States and Canada, but we do have people in other countries as well. Some people who are affiliated with our organization are also affiliated with other socialist organizations and active in them. Some are not affiliated with other socialist organizations, but we all agree with the system change, not climate change, principles of unity. And I just want to read the first short three sentences of that, of those principles. The current ecological crisis results from the capitalist system, which values profits for a global ruling elite over people and the planet. It must therefore be confronted through an international mass movement of working people around the world. We are building a multiracial, multi-ethnic left united against the ecological destruction spawned by capitalism. Please take a look at our principles of unity and please contact us to be part of our network. If you agree with those principles, which I hope you do. We at System Change would like to foster discussions and an understanding of what it means to get beyond capitalism. What does that look like? What does it not look like? Because it isn't just tweaking and leaving in place capitalist structures. We would like to foster discussion and understanding of where our power lies and how to use that to save ourselves. One of the things that we are doing is hosting webinars like this one today. We are asking visionary leaders to share with us their visions of what the world we're trying to get to looks like and how we can get there. I am honored to introduce today our speaker, Kali Akuno. Kali is the co-founder and director of Cooperation Jackson. He served as director of special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of the late Chakwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi. I believe that Kali is speaking to us from Jackson, but he can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Kali is a human rights educator, writer, and organizer. He focuses on building organizations and institutions for working class and oppressed communities. He is also the co-editor of Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi. Kali works at the grassroots level, promoting cooperative, justice-based, democracy-infused living, while also building the broader movement we need nationally and globally. Kali will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, and we will then have questions and answers. 
To make sure we all focus on Kali's presentation, we will have the chat turned off during his presentation and we will turn it on at the end. At that point, please submit questions to Ted Franklin, who might put questions in his name to help you remember that, but submit questions to Ted Franklin. He will funnel them to me and we will try to get to as many as we can during the 75 minutes that we have for this event. With that, I am pleased to give you Kali Akuno, who will discuss the path to eco-socialism and survival, spotlighting the work of Cooperation Jackson and discussing that organization's visionary call, the call to action towards a general strike. Kali, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, my name is Kali Akuno. I am speaking to you from what we call Megar Eversville, uh, Mississippi, uh, named after um, the late Mega Evers, human rights and civil rights uh, homegrown champion, who was taken from us early in 1963 as a result of a vicious racist assassination uh, here uh, in Jackson, uh, about a mile and a half from where I am sitting now. Um, I'm going to start a little bit different than what I have kind of outlined here in my notes, because I think there's been some critical shifts that have an impact, at least on the United States, and we know the United States has an inordinate impact on the world, unfortunately. Um, and that's what happened on Friday with uh, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, and kind of what the implications are for that, uh, at least as we see it and as I see it. Uh, we've been in a lot of dialogue here uh, in Jackson. We had a People's Assembly yesterday, uh, of which this was kind of a dominant theme. Uh, and what we've been doing is is really playing out uh, in our organizing work uh, and in the people strike in general, but here in Jackson trying to do a level of scenario uh, gaming in our and in, in game planning um, to be able to deal with the next couple of months of uh, basically kind of tumultuous chaos as we see it uh, arising as a result of initially of uh, the contest for power uh, as expressed through you know the challenge of the presidency and the challenge of the Senate in particular. Uh, but that definitely took a, a new twist with. Uh, Gainsburg dying uh, because of the centrality of how the, the Supreme Court in particular uh, has been a strategic focus of the right uh, for many decades, uh, but has been a cornerstone of, of their, I would say the last seven or eight years in particular of uh, their strategic kind of ascent to power. Uh, we should go back and remember, you know, how the same forces, um, basically blocked Obama from even getting a, a, a nomination, um, you know, when there was an opening on the court in 2016. And how Mitch McConnell, who was the, kind of the lead architect of this in, in the Senate floor, um, you know, just basically ex exercised his power, him and Lindsey Graham, and said, this is not gonna happen. Uh, and they gave, which I think anybody should know, you know, the excuse that, there shouldn't be a nomination during an election year. Well, now, uh, as that argument's come back, you know, I think the ra the rationality, at least as I saw it late last night, what his rationality was, um, what well, was was what makes it different this time, uh, is that uh, we have the same party in power in both the Senate uh, and the presidency, and so we should move it as opposed to last time, the Senate was under his control and and, uh, and under Republican control. Um, and the, the presidency was controlled by Obama. Now, I'm just saying that just in case anybody happened to have missed this news. I, I doubt if anybody has, but in case you missed what's happened in the last kind of 48, 72 hours, just give us the backdrop. I think this is so critical, at least from the vantage point of Mississippi. I can tell you that, that this has further galvanized the right uh, in an extreme way. And uh, at least from our vantage point, 
that was a critical piece that basically has kind of moved the needle closer, uh, I think, to just all out uh, uh, civil war. And I, I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that pejoratively. Um, one of the things we do here, and it just kind of has a consequence of, you know, uh, the history and the depth at which white supremacist forces, which are very open, blatant here, and have been for many generations, for many moons, uh, we monitor very closely right-wing radio and all of the right-wing kind of militia channels that, that we have some access to or knowledge of, you know, through the shortwave radios and other means of communication. Uh, and we do that for strategic purposes and have done so for years just to try to understand, you know, how folks are moving and what are they thinking, uh, who are they targeting, what are the key uh, 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 items on their uh, agenda. Uh, and here, this is very critical, you know, because, um, you know, Jackson, so you all know, is not a city that's that large. You know, it's under 200,000 people. The metro area, uh, which includes all the suburbs that kind of uh, literally feed off of Jackson, uh, bring you no more than 500,000 people. Uh, so in comparison to some of the mega cities, you know, that are around that are political heavyweights, so your Houston uh, or your Atlanta, uh, or even some that's just a little bit larger than us, Memphis or New Orleans, uh, you don't have this kind of uh, distance in the relationships. And what that means here is that many of the kind of open white supremacist forces know us, they know where we live, they know where we work, they know where uh, our movements and conversely, we know theirs to the greatest extent possible. You know, both sides have been monitoring each other uh, for years as kind of a practice. But we've been listening uh, to them for weeks now, just trying to see and anticipate how they have been reading things, particularly since the Floyd Rebellion. Um, and they've moved basically since Kenosha. They went from kind of a, a early depression and angst to now at least in this area, the dominant conversation, I would say, is, is bordering on euphoria and saying, look, we got this. Uh, uh, there's no way Trump is going to lose. Uh, and should there be any machinations, you know, from their point of view in the elections that they're going to, they have the forces necessary to enforce the Constitution, meaning uh, that they are going to take to the streets and enact justice uh, and the rule of law as they see, see fit. And what we've seen here in the past several weeks is people just, these forces up in their game. Um, you know, and, and that is included doing checkpoints, strategic checkpoints, particularly in and around Labor Day was when they kind of cropped up. We've heard uh, of similar actions taking place in, in, in Oregon, but this was going on all throughout uh, the South, not getting the... the I think the media coverage it justly deserves so folks are aware and can prepare. So we've been trying to put some of that out uh, through the vehicle of cooperation, Jackson, the people strike. Just so folks understand that there's one side of this kind of story right now, um, which is really preparing to kind of exercise his will through all means. And our side of this uh, terrible equation um, Unfortunately, I don't think he is moving with the same degree of urgency uh, and diligence in terms of uh, short-term planning or long-term planning, but definitely short-term planning as we need to. Um, so when we talk about the road, the, trend, <laughs> the road to uh, an eco-socialist future, regenerative future, there's some critical immediate hurdles that we are going to have to get over. Uh, and which is why I started with this and, and I will share with you all in the hopes that you would join us an initiative that's coming from uh, the people strike that started with a set of just kind of loose ideas, which I think are all on our minds is, is that uh, I think even before Gangsburg, you know, uh, unfortunately passed, I think it was probably on many of our minds, I would assume that um, we knew November 3rd was going to be a contest, is going to be in a contested election in one form or another. Uh, Trump has pretty much laid a firm foundation for that, and that almost none of the outcomes uh, are good, you know, from, from what that scenario is. 
So we've been trying to warn people of that. But in, and we started putting this latest initiative together that I'm gonna to speak to now, even before, um, literally hours before Gainsburg died, we put out a, a kind of initial internal draft, uh, which only kind of heightened in character. And let me say what this is. So basically, you know, uh, drawing on the rich history um, of kind of uh, pledges to resistance that have been out in our movements, you know, for, for almost what, over 200 years, but we are moving in that vein as people striking, going to put a, just a general call, you know, not even necessarily in our name, but just a general call to action uh, in this kind of pledge of resistance tradition. You know, many of you might recall one of the last, you know, kind of, I think, effective ones uh, was the Pledge of Resistance in the 1980s, uh, uh, focusing in on uh, defending uh, the social movements in Central America, Nicaragua and El Salvador in particular, um, uh, that myself and I'm, I'm sure many of you maybe uh, were part of a part of. So drawing on that, uh, we are going to ask everybody in the face of this kind of tumultuous time that we know is coming, uh, that when the challenge is, is issued, that on uh, November 4th, uh, that everyone who is able, you know, uh, hit the squares in your city uh, and make your presence, our collective presence known. And we would, we are encouraging folks to follow that up on November 7th, the Saturday, and try to move strategically uh, towards occupying the, the, the capital areas in each of our respective states. Uh, those are the two kind of immediate pieces because clearly um, nothing just is going to come from a resolution to this particular conflict from either the Supreme Court or from the Senate. We just all need to be clear on that, straightforward and direct and have no illusions about it. Um, you know, even if Biden should win, uh, I am quite sure he's going to, to win the, the, the popular vote, just my own personal view. Uh, the, the Electoral College is gonna be up for grabs, I think, unfortunately, but, um, I'm saying that even if, if that should happen, we have to remember, I'll just cite one, because this actually happened a couple of times, but the one that's got the most public attention was what happened with Gore in 2000, where that went to the courts, and then eventually it went to the Senate, and we know how that played out. Both of those institutions are co controlled by an extreme right reactionary force. So expecting them to either honor the Constitution for what that's worth, or to honor fairness and due process, it's not gonna happen. That means that the resolution primarily is going to be left up, I'm gonna borrow from Marx. We know when rights are in conflict, it's force that decides at the end of the day. And we are encouraging folks that we have to be an unwavering, nonviolent force that, that hits the streets and make our presence known. Um, and to make it known in a way that's not just about, uh, from our perspective in the people strike, not just about uh, kind of returning things to the way that they were. Because, you know, in honesty, uh, going back to, if you just say, want to go back to the days of Obama, uh, those were not happy times. They were not great times for the vast majority of people. Uh, and we are not going back to the way things were, nor should we. We need to be focusing on creating a just society. And so this is what we are encouraging folks to do in taking this pledge, in addition to hit the streets, uh, making our presence known, try to speak with the greatest level of clarity about kind of some transitional, transitional pieces that we think uh, we wanna put forward to the movement uh, to consider uh, advancing that would put the maximum pressure on both sides of this kind of electoral equation. And the first piece that we want folks to really you know, focus on, um, uh, is basically in, in an effort, if you want to call it a people's bailout. You know, they've been bailing out Wall Street, they've been bailing out corporations and the banks to the tunes of trillions of dollars since the pandemic hit. It hasn't been getting the, the, the kind of coverage that I think it just deserves. But while they're giving them out trillions, they're, they're arguing over pennies giving out 
uh, you know, to me and you and, and everybody else. We need to definitely flip that script and flip it hard and to say that not only should there be, you know, some form of uh, universal basic income distributed, but we need to make sure that all of the debts, the critical debts in society, and particularly those, you know, starting with the pandemic, those of the medical debt that so many people have accrued as a result of this crisis, uh, the rents and the mortgages that many people are now under, uh, the student loans and things of that nature, all of that needs to be just written off the books. And then that needs to be a critical piece. Those two kind of aspects of it that we think needs to go forward. Uh, we are still in the midst of a deepening pandemic. However much mainstream media, you know, uh, uh, is trying to look away or trying to make us think, think that things are, are somehow kind of getting better just because some people want to declare that. So I can tell you definitely here in Mississippi, uh, it's still spreading, spreading rapidly and spreading rapidly because of the just the, the ascientific uh, uh, but purely political driven public policies uh, uh, that they're following to try to get Trump reelected and to force folks to work under these conditions. Uh, so, you know, demanding universal health care in, in, this, in this case, uh, we know that there's something that uh, by all polls, the vast majority of people support, but there has been no concentrated political will on either side of the so-called aisle uh, to institute. And that's something that we need to make clear needs to happen uh, as a condition of kind of, you know, uh, moving this society forward. Uh, the other piece which has emerged that we want to uplift and, and uphold uh, is uh, uh, defunding the police, shifting all of those resources to the tremendous social needs we know we have in this society. Same goes for uh, defunding the military. And on top of that, you know, uh, being clear about uh, where, our, where we are situated responsibly uh, in the world system. And that is for us here in, in kind of the belly of the beast to demand that there be no further wars of aggression because we know that's on both of the political parties and both of the political uh, agendas. Uh, not just targeting uh, China, but there's also Iran, Venezuela, uh, et cetera. And there's just, I think, a, a general systemic dilemma of capitalism trying to kind of uh, get, get itself back into a period of unfortunate kind of creative destruction uh, uh, to kind of get the cycle of accumulation going again. We need to stand firmly opposed to that, you know. And then the last piece is, uh, from, from our vantage point that we want to put out the sixth point, uh, is that we need to, to start instituting uh, a just transition to eco-socialism. That is the last piece uh, that we are putting out uh, that we want to, to folks to carry forward uh, on the fourth and the seventh. And we know that this is going to be needed to be follow up. And so the piece that we're putting out is that beyond those two dates, we're going to need a continued pressure because we, you know, this drama is likely going to play itself out well into January, probably all the way up until the inauguration. And we need to, to keep the spirit that we've seen grow and manifest since the Floyd Rebellion in June, keep that level of urgency and consistency. You know, some of the things we've seen in, up in the Northwest, in, in Portland and in Seattle has been amazing in my view. Um, just the level of determination and consistency, we're going to need that on a national level, I think, to kind of deal with the crisis that's coming. Um, now, to speak to <laughs> deeper issues of this, of, this, of this piece of kind of a just transition as we are, you know, using that framework towards eco-socialism, the piece that we have been uh, putting out and are still trying to do a lot of work of, of developing and advancing is what we call a build and fight program. And that's essentially kind of, uh, you know, 10 kind of core um, both principles and practices. Uh, and we have been arguing that in the here and now, particularly since the pandemic, that we think that there's a kind of a strategic order that these things uh, should go in uh, on a programmatic basis based upon at least the first six concrete practices that millions of people are doing right now, you know, kind of as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, and the first kind of core component uh, uh, is developing and deepening our mutual aid work. 
uh, and not just from the perspective of distributing resources uh, to each other. That's a critical point. We know that there are millions of people in this country, you know, who have some major food uh, crisis. We see it in our community every single day. Every time we've done uh, some food or mass distribution, things just go, go largely before we even, you know, have an opportunity to un finish unloading the truck. So the need we know uh, is tremendous in this society right now with so many millions of people being thrown out of work, uh, unable to find work or the jobs that people have been able to uh, kind of uh, find are far, earning far less and under worse conditions than, than what they had before. So we know that there's a lot of concrete needs in that regard. But from a strategic point uh, of view, in our, in our perspective, there's a critical thing around, if, if we dare say, kind of politicizing some of this work. We think the explosion that we saw in March, April, and May was a good thing, was a, was a great thing. I think it's one of the most underrated things that have happened this year, in fact. Uh, and we say that because we feel that uh, what it demonstrated uh, was that the, the neoliberal project, as a project of trying to change all of our behavior and, and individuate us, separate us from each other, separate and fragment society, this crisis has clearly kind of demonstrated that it has not succeeded to the degree that many of us may have thought, or in many of the ways I think the capital wants it and needs it to, to kind of move its agenda forward. So this people coming together was a truly beautiful thing to take care of each other in a time of need, particularly uh, uh, in the early days when we didn't, I think most of us truly didn't even fully understand or grasp, you know, how the COVID-19 was, was spreading, you know, with, uh, just so much of the false information that was floating out at the time. I know I was in, in some debates and discussions in January, February, to give folks a heads up that was saying that black people couldn't get COVID-19. I mean, it was that level of just unscientific craziness that was just, just out there, I think, in the initial days that we were kind of combating. And folks not knowing, but knowing that there was needs in their community need to be addressed and coming together to do it was a beautiful thing. But we, I say that recognizing that the critical thing from trying to politicize it is building critical relationships with each other and finding out, A, what people need, what people want, making a distinction between the two, and then what, what kind of skills, talents, resources do we all have that we can collectively come together and build upon with each other? Like that, to me, is the most critical thing. Uh, where it's not just like a chair, where it switches from just being charity of giving things away to actually building relationships and then creating practices of solidarity that we can extend and then deal with one of the critical weaknesses that we know exists in a lot of mutual aid work, not all of it, but in a lot of mutual aid work is that it's very dependent upon either donations or like, you know, kind of uh, uh, fundraising drives or pitches, um, you know, uh, uh, in the main. Uh, and it's not necessarily always rooted in the productive capacity of what people are doing and then exchanging. And so that's where the second one to us comes in, in this build and fight program. And that is uh, the food sovereignty piece. And again, over the past, I would say 20 years, but particularly last uh, 10 years, I think we've seen an explosion of like the return to small farming and the, and the explosion of urban, you know, and community gardens all throughout the country. Um, we want to say again, trying to politicize that and say, can we form relationships where the mutual aid networks that are distributing kind of food and medical aid and, and supplies of that nature, can it directly be linked in each of our areas with, with intention, with the food level production that we are doing and again, the critical thing about trying to figure out what, what people concretely need and want, this is where part of that kind of comes in until we start establishing our own kind of internal kind of supply and demand uh, orientation and figuring out what skills do you have? What, what work can you do and willing to do uh, uh, during this time period? What are you capable and able to do? How can we do that to kind of ramp production up, particularly in, in around food to service the needs of our community? Very critical piece, which links to the third piece. Just trying to go uh, uh, a little bit faster, you all, uh, so we can get to kind of Q and A. 
um, the, the third piece is around the, the cooperative economics. And that's just not just co-ops in the, in the way that uh, we've been practicing, but also the other aspects of solidarity uh, uh, practices, you know, from the time banking uh, that folks could do to different types of land stewarding. And all those different types of practices need to be very much embedded to this to add to the productive capacity. And then the other piece here is us learning how to produce with each other and become democratic subjects in the, the democratic management and the self-management collectively in our communities of how to ramp up these things and, and meet our basic kind of needs. Uh, and that then leads to the, the other one, which is, you know, we need, from our vantage point, we need to uh, shift, you know, the, the type of industrial relations that many of us are involved in and shift that to the greatest extent possible on the local level to do, reduce carbon emissions, but also on the way of, of, of reframing both what materials we use and why. And, you know, so we kind of rid ourselves of this over chemical production, this over dependency on oil. So this community production piece is a central kind of component of bridging these things together. Uh, then the next piece um, is what is the people's assemblies and self-defense, those two kind of things going together. The self-defense, I think, in this day and age, uh, unfortunately, with the, the strength of the militias and the right and their support by many of the institutions, the repressive institutions from the police to the sheriffs to the homeland security to the border agents, um, all kind of working in tandem in many places. We know that it, when it comes to a critical point, if this work is done and moved to scale and it's taking people kind of uh, off the radar screen and getting people out of the Walmarts and some of these other places where we've been kind of dependent upon and made to be dependent upon, that there will definitely be political challenges and we need to kind of be prepared and ready for that. Uh, and we need to be able to kind of link all these things together in a broad community-based democratic practice. That's where the People's Assembly comes in. And we've situated these, these uh, kind of first sets of practices in, in what we call the practices of position using the Gromskyan uh, kind of framework to say these are the things that the foundations that we need to establish on our own autonomously to be able to push for a broader shift and a broader transformation and really just a, a deeper kind of contest uh, of power, not necessarily for us to assume uh, becoming a new state, but changing that relationship in the long run uh, overall. And that is where the next piece of towards moving towards a general strike, moving towards democratizing the economy, and then moving towards what we're calling freeing the land uh, uh, in its broadest senses of, of the term. Uh, and these are the, the kind of core practices we're saying of, of maneuver that where we know we have to put millions of people in concentrated federated motion with each other to be able to advance, to make a critical shift uh, towards the eco-socialist future, eco future that, look, let's be clear, we, we have to have or our time on this planet will be very short. If nothing, I think the past two or three years, but each year we can say this, but I think this year has demonstrated if, you know, down here we're hitting, we're getting hurricane after hurricane in a record pace, not normal, you know, becoming unfortunately new normal. Uh, but it's just a deeper indication that all the different scales and models that scientists have been predicting, you know, for the last, in many cases, 50 years, for the last 20 years in particular, we are well beyond most of those target points now. And we have to do some major work quickly if we're going to, you know, either have any hope of reversing, you know, all of these impacts or at least slowing them down and containing them. I don't have to speak to most of you on the West Coast about what's happening, you know, with the fires and, and, and the impact of, you know, it, it appears just greater desertification and continued drought that's happening on the West Coast as the weather patterns change. Uh, and getting to a critical point wherein, you know, I seriously wonder, you know, I know in California and parts of Washington now, you know, not only will those forests kind of ever recover, uh, at least in the span of our lifetime, or we are not just really witnessing the critical shift uh, of the destruction of some major beautiful areas with the redwoods and, you know, the, the special adaptations that uh, trees and plants have made up in that, in that region. Uh, which took millions, if not billions of years to, to develop, being wiped out in the span of a generation. 
So this is where we at. The urgency, both politically, economically, and ecologically, is here now. Uh, and this is kind of our uh, offering uh, uh, to give of how we think some things can move forward based on present conditions uh, in the society of present. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Kali. That was uh, that was fabulous. Um, <clears throat> we are now going to uh, make it possible for people to pose questions through chat, direct them to Ted Franklin. In the interim, why don't we just start with a couple questions from me. Um, first off, I think it might be helpful for some people uh, on the call who are not familiar with Cooperation Jackson, if you could just do a very brief, um, you know, here are some specific things that we're doing on the ground in terms of the work co-ops and your farming initiatives. Just real brief overview because some people don't don't actually know. Uh, uh, briefly, you know, so co-op, uh, Cooperation Jackson is, um, we are now officially six years old. Uh, the theory that kind of underlines our practice goes back way further than that. Uh, you can find it if you look for uh, uh, elements of what's called the Jackson Cush Plan of Peace um, that was really drafted in truth in response to Hurricane Katrina and the lessons that uh, we learned from that. Um, uh, and uh, we, within that plan, there were kind of core elements of, of transformation on the local kind of municipalist level and the regional level. Uh, that's the Cush uh, part of it, which is this contiguous uh, areas of 18 majority black counties in Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Mississippi. In Mississippi, having the vast majority of those, Jackson being right on the outskirts of that. Uh, and Cooperation Jackson was, was explicitly developed uh, to, to try and foster the solidarity economy aspects and practices of that. And over the, the, the last six years, of, through a lot of trial and, uh, uh, and error and development, uh, where we have landed now is that we have a, a community land trust, which has over uh, 50 uh, um, uh, parcels of land that we are stewarding, uh, which is where most of our uh, farming operations and commercial operations uh, are based out of, uh, the largest of which is uh, um, a mall complex that we just uh, put into the land trust last year called the Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, excuse me, the Ida B. Wells Plaza, uh, which is going to be uh, home to our people's grocery, which is going to be uh, both for kind of aquaponics, hydroponic uh, uh, operation with the kind of traditional uh, grocery oriented towards uh, more vegan and vegetarian lifestyles, which is a, a big part of what we're trying to switch, just given the, the acute kind of uh, dietary uh, uh, health crisis, which result from dietary uh, conditions and other development conditions here in Mississippi. Uh, we have chronic diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, particularly in the black community, but not exclusively in the black community and obesity. So this is a big problem or something we're trying to switch, shift and change. Um, and that is going to be anchored primarily by our farming operation, which is Freedom Farm, named after uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farms in, in that tradition. Um, and it's growing and expanding. Uh, it's, it's going to start uh, farming on one of our members' family uh, plot of uh, additional uh, 10 acres uh, with a combination of uh, hemp and bamboo that we're going to be using uh, and harvesting um, to do housing construction in, uh, in the main, uh, sustainable housing kind of materials and to, to move us kind of more off the grid with our eco village uh, initiative that we've been cultivating, particularly starting off on one street. It, <laughs> on the community land trust called uh, the Ewing Street. Uh, then there's our green team, which is landscaping and, and um, uh, like moving and think, I mean, they kind of are just doing a, a number of odd things, but mainly landscaping. Um, and then uh, the, the last one is our community production cooperative, which is a small scale uh, manufacturing uh, piece. And the main initiative there was just really trying to utilize um, the new techniques and in, in, um, some not so new uh, equipment, but you, new and uh, relatively new in how it's being used now, uh, like CNC machines and things of that nature, um, uh, to do our own level of uh, uh, industrial production in accordance to our needs to kind of shift that 
uh, and to have a base where we're not dependent upon, you know, the the mass multinational corporations or, or things in that nature. And a lot of this, the strategy of it is to do things that are very uh, interconnected and interdependent upon each other, our co-ops, uh, and the rationality of, of kind of how some things have developed over time very much kind of has, how does this one support that one? It's, it, the point is to us to build our own kind of healthy ecosystem uh, um, uh, and solidarity system, you know, so that we can both uh, um, deal with the limited set of resources. You know, uh, there's no lack of human resources in our community. There's a lack of capital resources. So how do we deal with that? And how do we deal with, you know, the viciousness that exists in Mississippi around uh, you know, the, the the various institutions of white supremacy, banks being a key one here, uh, how they function to basically oppress, exploit, and exclude us from various type of economic activities in our own self-interest. So our model is very much built with that in mind. Great. Well, I want to make sure before the call is over to get back to just how we can connect with the work you're doing there, people in other communities. But for now, let's, let's go uh, to some of the bigger nitty gritty problems um, <clears throat> that we're dealing with as a society. Could you explain a, a little bit more your vision of how we might move forward from the, um, the list of demands that you laid out that uh, make total sense? Um, uh, and I think you in particular mentioned uh, fighting for free medical care for everyone as a possible uh, unite everybody kind of thing that we could uh, coordinate around. How might it play out that we would have some kind of unity around uh, uh, Medicare for all or any of those other other measures? How would that ultimately, in your imaginings, I know it all has to come from below and we can't predict, but how would that feed into dealing with this horrific climate crisis that we're dealing with? particularly in light of what you pointed out, which is we have very little time to make massive decarbonization and transformation. So how might that look that we get to a point where we're perhaps having a general strike connected with Green New Deal type elements? Mm -hmm. uh, big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, One, one, we know a lot of folks work a lot of jobs that they don't want to do because they offer certain perks. And for many of us, healthcare is a critical one. Um, and I know a lot of us wouldn't be engaged in work that we feel is unethical or just straight up BS, uh, giving it a nod to Graber and his passing, you know, about BS jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, that exists. A lot of us wouldn't do that if we know certain basic things were being met collectively by society. And, and, and I'm building upon the first kind of initial iteration of a just transition, which was, you know, workers in the petrochemical and in the nuclear fields saying that we want to transition away from these dirty fuels and these dirty processes, uh, but to be able to kind of keep the standard of living, you know, that we had and, and, and also to protect the communities that were kind of the gate line and front line that were, were you know, absorbing all of the, the pollutions. Um, I think if, if, if the concrete setup was there, it moves us very quickly, why I'm saying it moves us very quickly to eliminate certain types of uh, professions and industries, which we've been made dependent upon, like the oil industry, the petrochemical industry, We've been made dependent upon that because of its dominance, you know, since, you know, the the age of the railroads, you know, and other things of that nature, industrial revolution. We've been made dependent because there's been uh, alternatives all along that process, different routes that, that you know, we could have gone. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we knew, we in the broad sense of, you know, the, the scientists, let's just say in our, our community, and in so-called industrials and government policy, you know, there were experiments with solar on a major scale back 80 something years ago. And folks knew that, that there could have be some critical transitions, even in the automobile uh, 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 industry, particularly as technology improved. Um, you know, the combustible engine was not the first the, uh, design and it wasn't the only design, it was just a design that 
those set of forces uh, uh, fixated on in an alliance uh, to kind of direct some things in the way that they went. If we could just start with shifting some of that, a lot of that stuff automatically and necessarily goes away and we become less dependent upon it. And the medical industry is deeply tied up uh, with the petrochemical industry. You know, uh, how, I mean, I just, just look in many ways at how medicine is produced and how many things from what, Vaseline to uh, aspirin and all those other things are very much tied up into, you know, the petrochemical industry that we can automatically shift and move to a more ecologically based, more herb based, you know, plant based form of uh, regeneration. If we knew that we can change some of these conditions, starting with a broad universal uh, aspect of, of the application of healthcare, I think it, it leads directly towards a path, uh, or it could lead, let me put it, it could lead more, us more directly in the path uh, uh, towards the type of eco-socialist transition that we need. And I say could, to, to correct myself, because there will be a political battle, you know, still. Like some forces may be willing to say, we'll, we'll grant this, but we, won't, we don't want to change, say, the ownership of, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies, because the pharmaceutical companies are some of the richest and most powerful institutions in the society, right next to the petrochemical industry. So, in, in the Medicare, I mean, the insurance and the capitalization. So if we hit that, right, and we do it right, we change how finance works. We change the, the relations of, of, of power, not only here in the United States, but globally, because we change this whole dynamic. Let's just start with the pandemic and how like, like the Trump administration has played it. They pulled out of the, the, the World Health Organization and various treaties assuming that it's going to be American corporations that come up with the vaccine and they did so so that they could profit from it exclusively at the at the you know the 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 detriment to the vast majority of people in the world who will not be able to afford the high price that they're going to put on these things so we break that kind of power hold and move ourselves in a different direction if we can crack this nut here in the United States it won't just have a US based kind of focus it'll have a global focus and that's a critical part in this transition because, you know, the, the transition we need is a global one. It's not just in the U.S. It's not just in Canada. It's a global one. And we got to create the conditions starting in the United States, I would argue, uh, to make this transition. And this is one place, if we do it right, we break the, the power of so many uh, just uh, institutions deeply wedded, you know, to profit making at the expense of, of life on this planet. Right. Uh, let me ask a question that Maura Stevens submitted, um, and I'll tack uh, a related question onto it. Are you heartened by the recent bankruptcies and production withdrawals of several of the North American fossil fuel corporations? Have you been connecting with their workers during this time to make them aware of different, more sustainable work options? And related to that, my own question is, uh, are, are, do you agree that the fossil fuel industry needs to be brought into public ownership that we might shut it down. I wholeheartedly agree with the last part. The first part, I'm, I'm, this is where there is some um, degree of honesty I think we need to have, uh, I think, in our political work. And, and, and why do I say that? Um, you know Trump's relationship with the with the petrochemical industry is is very plain and upfront because he's made it plain and upfront. Biden's relationship is not as as plain because it's been more kind of in the background, not in the focus. But he's just as much in that corner, uh, I would argue, as Trump is. Not as boldly or you know blatantly, but you know thus far. He said that he will not stop fracking, for instance, when we know that's something that needs to end yesterday. So we need to be clear, I think, going forward, like our articulation of those six kind of pieces have to be directed really at both sides. Um, and where I'm cautious about reading too much into the recent failures is, is on the basis of the degree to which 
the petrochemical industry has been subsidized by the United States and by various you know, European nations now for well over 80 years. And we have to break the back of those subsidies. They're less in Europe to a degree than they have been here. But these industries, I would argue, many of them would have collapsed a long time ago if it wasn't for that. And in a degree of commitment, uh, the Fed has, has demonstrated towards kind of propping up uh, all these corporations in the midst of this pandemic and the whole just monopoly money game that they've been playing uh, on, on Wall Street. Uh, I think they will, without the proper political, you know, directed focus on our part to shift these dynamics, um, they're hurting, but they're, they won't be, you know, they're not dead and they can be resurrected. And so, you know, my point is they're not going to fall on their own. They're not going to change on their own. We have to build a political force that ensures that they don't come back, that they don't survive. Uh, and that, that starts with the public, you know, uh, ownership and control. Uh, but then it has to be really situated on the transition away from that to not allow them to recover. So we got some work to do in that, in that area. You know, we have a little upper hand, but, and, but we, I don't know if we're organized and clear enough in the, in the moment uh, to be able to kind of push that where it needs to go. But us talking about it and being clear and putting it out as a demand is a critical piece. And for me, I can say that um, the, the, the piece where this particular question is most embedded in is in this piece around ending the, the U.S. war machine and the stopping the, the acts of aggression because oil and war within the United States uh, and the United States military being the largest consumer and to a degree kind of insurer of oil, if we change that relationship, we weaken them severely, the, the, this, the dependency on uh, uh, the petrochemical industry that the modern kind of industrial world is, is fixated around. That's why that one is not just critical to because of all the human rights abuses and exploitation, but what they're actually, what that institution means for the planet and its health. We have to look at it from that perspective as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, read questions that have come in uh, through the chat from Patricia Rodriguez. Um, has Jackson, Mississippi, felt impacts already of these violations. How have they collect people's projects and communities there fared? Has there been a need to think about things such as people's guards along the lines of what happens in Latin America, uh, but with a strong presence or role? Uh, <laughs> by state and paramilitary groups. You broke up on me, or I don't know if it's my system or your system. Okay. It's a right. part of the question How, I didn't hear. Has Jackson, Mississippi felt impacts already of these attacks by militias? How have the great collective people's projects and communities there fared? Has there been a need to think of things such as people's guards along the lines of what happens in Latin America with indigenous campesinos, Cinex, Afro descendant guards, nonviolent? but with strong presence and role versus violence by state and par paramilitary groups. I'm, I'm, I'm not, right. the, the grammar has been lost in the, the sending forward to me, but I think you get the gist of the question. Well, this is one of the things that we, we have been saying for years that uh, living in Mississippi gave us the benefit of time and that, you know, the, the, the madness that everybody sees in Trump, that's been the norm down here basically since the 1890s. Uh, and the rhetoric that, that everybody has been exposed to is, is standard kind of practice down this way. Sometimes cold, but you know it's, it's clear and it's obvious. You know what what uh, many of these politicians. I mean, hell, we had the last governor, not the present governor, but the last governor. I mean, he was uh, a descendant of one of the um, uh, folks who was responsible for the murder of Emmett Till. That was our governor. Um, and that's not like that was a secret. Everybody around here knows, you know, um, some of these basic facts. Uh, and the fact that he was elected, you know, I think uh, uh, with the clear knowledge of that history said something. And folks should remember, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan started his uh, presidential campaign, uh, uh, what, his, his uh, what was it, 1980, 
presidential campaign here in Mississippi um, uh, at one of the spots where Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, uh, you know, disappeared, sending a clear signal then, uh, you know, what type of law and order and what type of order that, that he planned to ensue. And, and Donald Trump uh, copied him, not only with that phrase, make America great, that's something that Reagan articulated, borrowing from other sources, but which I won't name right now, but um, so there's been a knowledge of that here. And there's a, there, we've, there's heavily um, connected forces in, in Jackson and parts of the Delta of just levels of self-defense that have been here for a long time. Um, and folks are activated, you know, um, some of the things I could tell you, I won't tell you on this thing, but you know, it's, we've been trying to warn folks of some signs that we saw a couple of years ago and that were a prelude to this. I'll say one here, um, you know, when um, the level of gun sales here since Obama have, it, uh, was elected in 2008, in 2008 has just have been off the charts. Um, there, there is no ammo almost of any caliber in any gun store available in Mississippi. Now this, I'm hearing that this is the case throughout the country. Well, we've definitely seen and heard that here. And, you know, to, to, to get a sense, now Trump emulated a policy that was going on here and in other Southern states. But you guys remember what the essential services were, the things that were open and allowed to be open, you know, in, in uh, uh, April, May, you know, in June during that critical lockdown. Mississippi was one of the first states that said that the things that could be open and that were essential, hospitals, grocery stores, gas stores, and gun stores. Gun stores were essential, okay? Then in the logic, they were essential and never closed, not one day here, not one day. They've always been open. So, uh, and that, that wind up, if folks go back and check, that was also on Trump's list of something. He put that in afterwards, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but those things were declared essential off the top. That was declared essential off the top. So we've been seeing a buildup of all these, these militia groups and armed stuff like that's been here for a long, long time. The Tea Party, just so you guys understand, in truth, it's not the Republican Party that governs Mississippi right now. It is the Tea Party. That's who really runs Mississippi. That's the generation that took over during the, 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 the Obama administration. And it was a precursor of the, the new set of forces on the right that Trump kind of appealed to and galvanized that is reshaping the Republican Party from within. So we've been dealing with this for a while. Um, you know, does, does that mean uh, we are fully prepared to deal with the future? No, I would not lie to you and tell you that. And the reason being, you know, some of the reasons why you don't see um, the parading of a militias and stuff like, like that in Mississippi, they, they exist and they do, they're around, you just, you know, we don't have the media coverage nationally. But there's also another reason you don't see it in the same way. Um, and that's because in, in here in a lot of places, they don't need to exist because the very explicit role that they would play is already played by the police and already played by the sheriff. Right? They already control those institutions, those very same politically, ideologically driven forces. So there's no need to have a militia. And what we've seen here historically is that when push comes to shove, particularly the sheriffs, they will deputize the, the militias in a heartbeat, you know, uh, here. So there's an asymmetric, you know, asymmetry, no matter kind of what we do in the here and now, which is why us building links in solidarity with other forces in this country is so vital to what we do uh, and why we've tried to engage in so much of it, you know, from Cooperation Jackson's perspective, because uh, if we didn't do that, this is a place where you can get isolated uh, very quickly, and that has been the historic, you know, design around how, you know, uh, uh, the planters who set this up continue to run it as an op as a plantation to this day, uh, and they aim to keep it that way. And and us connecting with folks and trying to educate them and let them know what's going on is one of our ways of breaking that that grip of power. Thank you. I'm my child care is killing me. 
I'm, I'm going to have to leave in a few four, uh, minutes, unfortunately. So we, oh. this, I had, we had to switch switch people up. There was an emergency a little bit earlier. So I, I apologize, everybody. <laughs> um, that, that's fine. If you can hang on till the quarter after, that would be great. And hello, uh, child down there. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing daddy with us. <clears throat> Ted Franklin asks, last weekend, the Green New Deal Committee of the Democratic Socialists of America held a two-day nationwide summit looking at transitional demands to put forward at this time. One of the major focuses was a people's bailout, people's budget, people's shock doctrine. Another was a massive guaranteed jobs program with a focus on green public works care and repair. Is a massive public works guaranteed jobs program in your vision? Yes, I would say for sure. Um, I didn't know, this is good to know. I, did, I knew that there was some discussion around these things, but I didn't know it in the past, so that's, that's good. Uh, hopefully that goes all throughout the DSA. So any of you who may be in one of the various caucuses of committees, you know, um, I hope you help advance this and push it forward and make connections with um, forces like ours and others out there who, who are pushing the same. But yeah, I think this is a, a critical piece that we has long been uh, a need in many of our communities. The question is, um, we need to make sure these are strategically employed work and skills training and development that comes with this and not just kind of more BS jobs or just paying people to be paying people. Not that I'm against that in any form or fashion, but from a perspective of us trying to transition things to an eco-socialist future, there's a level of scaling up you know, uh, around permacultural design and, and agroecology sets of skills that we're going to need, uh, uh, doing cooperatives. So things of that nature, which help enable the, the, the creation of democratic subjects and things that won't require, that we can develop, that won't require these massive effusions of energy, you know, in the way that it's produced and distributed, uh, that makes our communities, you know, more reliant, that do things to restore you know, there are environments like here, we need major restoration of, of the wetlands and uh, a major uh, 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 restoration around some of the, the basins around the Mississippi. So there's particular things that we know we need skills for, where there's a critical shortage um, that we think these jobs should be and not just like, well, let's just create some temporary kind of construction jobs to get us through a crisis. You know, we're talking about, from, our, from my vantage point, things that, that we know can and will be needed for generations to come. And, and more orient us, I think, as part of the, the, the deeper part of the transition, you know, the, the sides of it, which, which aim towards, you know, eliminating uh, um, uh, wage labor in, in the long term and commodity production, things that, that orient us uh, in and around kind of creating or recreating roles in our society you know, uh, that are critical for the functioning and well-being of us all, as opposed to just jobs, uh, um, you know, which are situated around uh, uh, wages. I think those are some critical ways in where we're going to have to shift. And if we're going to use this kind of piece of developing this job program, it, it needs to be articulated with the long-term kind of objectives in mind, not just the short-term you know, kind of relief oriented objectives. I think we need to be strategic about how we apply it and what we put forward. Uh, um, that would be you know, be my only addition, I think, to that particular uh, piece that I like to see us collectively debate and sharpen up. Okay, well, I'm hoping to get uh, one last um, question out before, well, two more questions. <laughs> uh, one is more substantive and one is kind of more uh, process how to connect. So on the substantive front, I'm hoping you can talk with us about the power and the potential of strikes, striking, withholding labor, as opposed to other forms of resistance. We have questions uh, that some have raised about whether it's even possible to be talking about getting to a general strike capacity. Look at, you know, we don't pour in the streets like the yellow vests do. Look at the sorry state of the, the uh, union, union uh, participation in the country, all that kind of stuff. Is it even, even possible? And kind of the flip side of that is some of us are asking, can we 
get where we need to go without developing the ability to withhold our labor uh, and have solidarity on a grand scale of doing that. So if you could, could talk about strikes, the potential, the, the challenges. Well, I'll start with the back end. We're not going to need, we're not going to get where we, where, where we need to go if we don't develop that collective muscle. Uh, you know, uh, to learn how to withhold our labor. And the, the other side of that is the level of relationship and connectivity and organization it will take means that we could also use their labor in other strategic ways for things that we want to do outside of what the bosses and the companies dictate. So there's a two-way street to that that we need to kind of look at and develop, right? Because we could say, hey, we're, we're, we're just going to leave all their jobs and go do, you know, uh, another set of things or uh, looking at some of the things that, that from, from earlier perspectives and generations, say, uh, if we had a deeper orientation, like what some of the forward workers were saying, we should be stop making cars and make masks. Well, if we democratize those industries, we determine that, right? Not the corporate bosses, not the stockholders and the shareholders, but we could do that. And if us who is, you know, <coughs> excuse me, it's workers who know how to do that and who are actually doing the work. Uh, if we actually democratize them, you know, take it out of their, their ownership and control, then we can make these critical shifts. So we cannot think about uh, uh, just leaving things as they are. We actually have to change the overall sets of relationships of who owns and controls the means of production. That is not off the equation by any stretch of the imagination. It's still something that we need to endeavor to do and be clear about it. Now, uh, is in the way that the, the modern economy, or at least the modern kind of uh, uh, US economy is articulated, is just withholding our labor enough? I would argue no, actually. Uh, because so much of how and what we do is so dependent upon, in, in a number of intricate ways, is now dependent upon various types of digital communication and automation. Uh, and if there's another critical circulation of resources that we have to be, be mindful of, and that is all uh, the, the different forms of credits, you know, uh, and financial flows which, which structure our lives, which govern our lives. And so one of the things in the people strike that we've been trying to articulate is, you know, the formula is basically no work, uh, no shopping, you know, in strategic uh, uh, times and places. Uh, and then the other third one, it's been more, but these three, no work, no shopping, and then no rents and no mortgages. Right? So that's another critical one where we know there are millions of people now. I think it, one of the estimates is something like one-fourth of the country has not, has not been able at some period of time in the last six months to be able to cover their rent or mortgage. Well, let's say if we could put our, uh, uh, those millions of people together and employ that as a critical rent strike or mortgage strike and do it together and do it intentionally and organize in a way that we can start dictating terms to, you know, to the banks, <laughs> to, the, to uh, uh, the, the various types of loan sharks and things out there and combine that with the strength of the, of the withholding of labor and do it together. So we've been trying to articulate these three as a way of, in, in, under our, you know, time, space, and conditions, these are the things that we need to be focusing on building a joint consciousness and a joint movement around to be able to exert kind of a maximum strength and a maximum unity to impact the flow of society. Um, and it also does a, a, a critical thing of kind of, uh, um, this enables us to go deeper in, in uh, communities where late, where having a job, um, you know, just really has not been an option and not been an option for a while. Um, uh, but folks still participate in the economy in various ways, you know, in shopping and in consuming in other ways. So it also harnesses their power, right? The, the folks who've been displaced from these kind of productive relations, but who are growing in number day by day because of, of the, the kind of development of automation and they're feeling to this rolling part of where, you know, again, Greg, we're talking about these BS jobs. Like 
Some of that was just keeping people contained. But it's also, you know, the element of uh, where and how we could include others who are kind of more off the books, if you would, but also play a critical role in society. So this is how we can incorporate folks who are, are you know, don't have papers, quote unquote, and folks who are in prison or folks who are in the detention centers, ways in which the, that we can all act in and stand in solidarity and support to kind of maximize our power and strength. Um, and then in this way, it's not, it's a the strategy which ultimately is, is not exclusive of the forces of organized labor, but it recognizes the weakness that only about 10% of the society now is in any form of union. Uh, the vast majority of those are now in pub, you know, public sector jobs. Um, <clears throat> and so how, we, how can we touch, uh, connect with the forces who are now kind of organizing and developing their strength at the targets in the Whole Foods and the Walmarts and the, the Amazons who don't have formal unions, but if tied with community uh, uh, action and support in other broad ways, we maximize their strength. So, you know, if we could do a, a critical set, for instance, if we can do a critical set of, we know we can guarantee in the community or, or in general, that millions of us are not going to strategically shop and there's a strike at a Walmart or an Amazon at the same day, how much power and leverage that gives us, you know, completely. So that's the way we're trying to reformulate, you know, reformulate this notion of a general strike that includes as many of us uh, as possible can participate, whether we're unemployed, you know, or uh, uh, employed, uh, because we're going to need both to get to where we need to, where we need to go in this society. And we need to be cognizant of that. Well, great. We, we are at our time limit. So I, I just want to end by asking you if you could please uh, share with us the practical things we can do to connect with you. How can we support Cooperation Jackson? Uh, there were a number of questions uh, such as, you know, how, uh, how should I work on starting a co-op here? So is there a federation or a, an alliance of Cooperation Jackson groups that we can plug into as well as supporting and being in contact with Cooperation Jackson? And is the call for action proceeding? Is there a group that's meeting that people can plug into? Just, you know, uh, where, where do we go on the internet? Who do we call? Who do we email? For, for, for more of the media stuff and stuff relative to the general strike, definitely want to connect with the people strike uh, on that. And we meet uh, to do kind of broad coordinating and planning now every two weeks on, on a Monday. It's typically at uh, 12 o'clock East Coast time, nine o'clock in the morning, unfortunately. Uh, West Coast time, um, and the next one will be not this Monday, but the following Monday. So that'll be a good place to check in. This call that I described in the beginning, that's going to go out probably no later than Tuesday, and we're going to be reaching out to all the different organizations that we are aware of, DSA and, and uh, PSL, which is kind of some some recent attack. Uh, you know, just any and everybody to, if, if you can't adopt this one, take up some variant, very, with the, the things that you unite with on your own and put those things out. The, the critical thing is we need millions of people out on the street, you know, doing these critical pieces in time. Um, and to connect with uh, Cooperation Jackson, um, you know, more directly, there is a growing federation of, of uh, co-ops, Cooperation Humboldt. There's some folks up in the Seattle area that we've been in some dialogue and, and uh, uh, talking with. Uh, uh, for for a good minute now, and trying to do some. We were doing more support before COVID. Uh, we're even supposed to go up there and like do some training and stuff like that, and it kind of got interrupted. Um, um, so that's going on. Uh, there's community movement builders, um, uh, primarily based out of Atlanta, but also has connections in Detroit, in San Diego, uh, and several other cities where they're doing some work now. Um, you know, and the easiest way to connect with us is is either through uh, Facebook, most immediately, we're on there every single day, Cooperation Jackson. Our email is cooperationjackson at gmail.com. Easiest way to reach us uh, is either through one of those two. But also on uh, Twitter at, uh, was it, at Cooperation uh, JXN uh, and Instagram, which our, our young people are, are, are on doing that and how it functions and work. So that's another uh, uh, critical way uh, we are all always could use um, sustainers, folks. You can't the way we're set up. 
uh, to kind of eliminate aspects of, of folks bidding, fitting off of other people's work. So you can't be a member directly of Cooperation Jackson if you don't live in the state of Mississippi, is one of our principles. But uh, uh, we, um, ab about, I would say, one sixth of our total um, budget is through uh, sustainers that come from throughout the country and the world. Uh, and we could all, always, you know, uh, use those to kind of grow and develop and keep ourselves afloat and not have to be uh, dependent, you know, on, on, on grants and loans, which sometimes come and sometimes are blocked, just given the, the conditions here. Uh, so we could always use that support. Um, yeah, those are the basic ways I would say that people can get in contact uh, with us. Um, people can get in contact with me directly on, on, on Facebook. I'm probably at my, close to my friend's limit. So you just uh, hit me on the, uh, the, what is it? The personal message thing. Uh, and I will definitely get to you or connect with me uh, by email. My email is kaliakuno at, at gmail.com. Uh, um, sometimes can't respond immediately, but I respond to every single uh, email eventually. Um, and uh, yeah, let's stay connected. You know, um, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of things we need to, to build and to strengthen. Um, and it's going to take time and intentionality to do it. So, you know, let's connect. And, you know, thank you guys for listening and joining. Hopefully you got something out of it today. Well, we definitely did. And I want to mention that a recording of this event will be posted and we will make that contact information readily available to people. I want to thank you for your invaluable presentation, Kali, especially with your child care challenges and for the extraordinary work you are doing uh, for justice and for survival. I want to thank the people with System Change, not uh, Climate Change, who helped make this event possible. And I want to thank everybody who attended. Apparently, we have people from uh, not only the U.S. and Canada, but Australia, Ireland, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and other places. So let's do continue this uh, discussion. Uh, please, everybody, take a look at System Change, not Climate Change, uh, .org. Look at our principles of unity and think of us as a network. If you agree with the principles of unity, if you're, you agree that we need eco-socialism to survive and have a just world, uh, contact us and uh, be part of continuing these discussions. I think that is it. We are going to leave the chat on until uh, half past the hour for people who want to still chat. Uh, and I think it's going to be more opened up at this point. But thank you so much, uh, Kali, for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a good day.